for introductions. My name is Monica Oxford. I'm the executive director of the Barnard Center for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health and faculty at the School of Nursing at the University of Washington. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our Barnard Center free lecture series. I think you can see a screen, yes? Okay, good. Um, first, before we get started, I want to do a land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Sahelish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared water of all tribes and bands within the Squamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And this is a map of the many, many nations that existed here as indigenous uh, communities and tribes long before uh, Europeans arrived. And we just really want to acknowledge uh, the uh, indigenous um, owners of this, our indigenous inhabitants of this land. So uh, I will mention we have a couple more interesting talks coming up in March and May. So Dr. Allison Ventura will be presenting March 15th, promoting responsive bottle, bottle feeding and re to reduce overfeeding and prevent rapid weight gain during infancy. Uh, and Dr. Khadijah Johnson, or, uh, actually it's Ms. Khadijah Johnson will present May 18th on infant and early childhood mental health consultation. And you might know Khadijah Johnson's work is she's um, kind of the queen of infant mental health consultation. So that'll be really a great talk to uh, attend. All right. And those Invites will go out through the Barnard Center email, through PCRP, and um, or you can go to our website directly to register. So I am super excited today to introduce my colleague, Dr. Eden Shaliv. He is an associate professor at the Department of Biobehavioral Health at Penn State University. His research entails interdisciplinary approach to identifying mechanisms underpinning the biological embedding of stress, how stress gets under the skin, and its effect on health and aging. And I mean, just contextually thinking about the importance of aging and the onset of early disease process for folks who've ex been exposed to greater stress, this body of work is really critical as we move forward in thinking about prevention and intervention for families exposed to adversity and social structural inequality. Uh, Shalev's research combines disciplines in molecular genetics, endocrinology, neurobiology, and psychology. The systems approach integrates data sources across multiple levels of genomic uh, biomarkers and phenotypic data. Specifically using innovative research designs, his research tests the effect of stress from early life on change in telomere strengths and other biomarkers of aging across a life course and the consequence of those changes in telomere length and physical and mental health problems. And he's really um, one of the first that I know noted back in the early uh, 2010s, 2013, that did some uh, very innovative research looking at violence effect on the uh, uh, telomere length on children between age five and 10. So he probably will reference that research. I will. Uh, Okay, good. That's what got me intrigued with his, his, his approach. Um, the goal of this research is to pinpoint behavioral and molecular targets for public health observation and clinical treatments, importantly, aimed at mitigating the consequence of stress and health on health and aging. Shalib is a Mark uh, T. Greenberg Early Career Professor for the Study of Children's Health and Development and author of more than 60 scientific articles and chapters. And so I've stopped sharing my screen. We'll give uh, Dr. Shaliv a moment to launch his. And again, welcome everybody. So happy to see everybody here today. I recognize a couple of faces. Um, oh, Carrie, Dow Smith, <laughs> um, and partners. All right. All right, Great. hopefully you can see uh, my slide, my screen. Is it we okay? We see it in screen mode, you're, you're good to go. All right, awesome. Let me just move all of the images. All right, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Oxford, uh, for the nice introduction and for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, I'm very excited to share with you all uh, some of the research that is going on in the field. 
Uh, the goal for this talk is to uh, discuss the current state of the science uh, of how early life adversity gets under the skin and program biological systems, what we call biological embedding, uh, which in turn may increase risk for uh, later life physical and mental health problems. So I hope uh, this talk will be clear and interesting for you, and I, I look forward for uh, the Q&A session. So here specifically, I will talk uh, mainly about telomere biology as a potential platform for discovery and uh, intervention studies. Uh, but as well, I will mention limitations uh, in the field and uh, new approaches to investigate the biological embedding of early trauma. So uh, I want to start with a big question of how early life adversity gets under the skin to generate variability uh, in health and aging. And there are uh, two important questions here. So first, how do we link uh, early life processes with health and aging? So we know that early life adversity is a risk factor for a range of uh, negative health outcomes that are observed decades later. So how do we link those early life processes with health outcomes uh, later in life? And second, uh, why should we even care about aging uh, in early life? So I will try to answer those uh, questions uh, in the next slides. And I guess the first question is, why should we care about aging? So what I'm showing you here uh, is a hypothetical scenario uh, based on calculations in animal models. So for example, if we keep the conditions as they are today, uh, the typical 50-year-old American woman would look forward to another 31 years of life. Uh, with the mean age of death at about 81 years. Assuming if we eliminate all forms of cancer, that is the hypothetical adjustment of cancer mortality risk to zero at all ages above 50, this would increase this woman's life expectancy by only 3.7 years with a death expected on average at about age 85, which is sobering to think about and it's obviously wishful thinking to think we can cure cancer today. We can do the same uh, exercise if we cure heart disease today or if we cure both cancer and heart disease. This will only increase the lifespan by uh, a few more years. And in fact, the complete elimination of all death due to cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes would produce a mean lifespan of about 97 years or a change in the mean age of death of only 17%. This is of course not bad, but also again, wishful thinking that we can eliminate all of these diseases today. And the reason that uh, the disease at the time approach is so unproductive is that most causes of death show an exponential rather than a linear increase in incidence across the last third of the lifespan. So in other words, treatment of individual diseases is likely to generate only modest um, improvement in overall lifespan because individuals who avoid one disease are often sickened uh, by another. What this model also shows is that as the estimate uh, of the longer lifespan that we would expect if we can decelerate the aging process itself at the biological level to the extent that has been uh, routinely feasible in animal models delaying the onset of all of the age-related diseases altogether, and by that also increasing the lifespan in this model to around 113 years. So targeting the uh, process of aging is obviously very important, uh, and it's in the cutting edge of the geroscience field. So I guess the next question uh, is to ask is how early can we start to see uh, an impact uh, of biological aging? And the short answer is very early. And the point that I want to emphasize here is that although the word aging uh, is associated with old age and elderly individuals, I assume most of you, if you think about the word aging, you will look at the right end of this uh, figure. Uh, but aging at the biological level is a lifelong process that begins almost at conception. The manifestation of age-related diseases is mostly seen at old age, but the aging process, again, at the biological level is uh, lifelong. And there is uh, an interesting story uh, related to that. Uh, I think probably most of you have heard about uh, the 2008 movie, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, 
uh, and no worries if you haven't seen it, I'm not going to spoil it to you. Uh, so this is a movie that is based on a short story by Scott Fitzgerald that was published in uh, 1922. The main character uh, named Benjamin Button, uh, depicted here on the right uh, by Brad Pitt with tons of makeup, uh, is born as a seven-year-old man who is edging backwards. So he's born with the brain of a baby that uh, edges forward, but uh, the body is a body of a seven-year-old man uh, who is edging backwards, becoming younger looking uh, with time. So the story about people who age backwards uh, is obviously fictional, but uh, Fitzgerald was influenced by what was then uh, a new disease to medicine called uh, progeria. And there are two forms of this uh, condition in humans. There is the adult onset and the juvenile onset progeria, also known as the Hutchinson-Guilford uh, progeria. Children with this uh, disorder uh, have a phenotype that resembles premature aging. Uh, and many of the symptoms are characteristics of geriatrics. And in fact, most of the children uh, with progeria have an average lifespan of about 15 years, which is obviously very sad. Uh, so this rare genetic uh, condition is related in part to poor telomere maintenance, uh, meaning that their cells in the body age very rapidly and as a consequence, their body is aging uh, as well. So what this story illustrates is that uh, aging processes can be observed early in life. And second is that uh, telomeres can play a causal role uh, in this process. So what are these telomeres? If you've never heard about telomeres before, uh, they are this uh, repetitive DNA sequence, the six nucleotide repeat, the TTAGGG, that repeats itself hundreds and thousands of times uh, at the ends of all chromosomes in all of our cells in the body. And together with other proteins, uh, they form this cap and structure at the end of the chromosomes to protect the chromosomes from uh, DNA damage. Uh, they're doing this in a manner very similar to uh, the aglets, to the plastic tips that we have at the end of the shoelaces that protect the shoelaces from fraying, from unraveling, so this is a similar function that uh, telomeres play at the end uh, of all chromosomes. One of the natural phenomenon uh, of telomeres is the shortening uh, of telomeres with each cell division, what you see here uh, on the left. And uh, every time the cell is dividing, the DNA needs to be uh, replicated. But because the DNA machinery in the cell is unable to replicate the chromosomes until the end, we are losing these small segments of telomeres with each uh, cell division until they reach a critical short length and then the cell die or enter uh, a state of cellular senescence, which is one of the hallmarks of aging and a contributor to a lot of these age-related uh, diseases. So in short, telomeres are considered to function as a clock that regulates how many times an individual cell can divide. And because the telomeres erode uh, over time, they are correlated with chronological age, meaning that the older we get, the shorter the telomeres are uh, on average due to this increased number of cell division uh, in our body. Uh, what is also known is that shorter telomeres has been linked with various diseases, including cardiovascular disease and cancer, as well as early mortality. And to add to that, there is research also indicating that telomeres can be influenced by exposure to stress, and I will uh, show you some examples uh, in relation to that. Hopefully we're good to go and no kind of major questions so far. All right. So just to illustrate the impact of age on telomeres, um, the rate of telomere erosion or shortening is not constant. Uh, even though we don't really have good evidence uh, from birth to death, uh, there's some evidence to suggest that the rate of shortening is uh, the fastest in the opening years of life because of the increased number of cell division uh, in the opening years of life. And then there is this gradual increase as we grow old. So again, there's, this is a very sensitive uh, developmental period that we think there is a fast shortening rate of telomeres independently of stress exposure. Uh, 
there's also other notable differences uh, between uh, men on the left here and women here on the right. Um, so what is known has been replicated multiple times and it's a known fact today in the field is that women on average have longer telomeres than men, uh, which may explain in part uh, the longer lifespan in women versus men. But what you also see here in the figure, so each dot here represents an individual, you also see the really large variations between individuals. So for example, if we take uh, cross-sectionally at age 40, there are some individuals here with very short telomeres and some individuals with very long telomeres and some individuals with kind of the average telomeres that you would expect for that age. So there is a lot of factors that contribute to these uh, variations between individuals. Uh, there's some genetic factors, but also environmental uh, factors as well. So telomeres are correlated with chronological age, but they can tell us more than just that. Uh, telomere uh, are considered today to be a marker for biological aging, what's known as the wear and tear of the system, rather than just a clock for chronological age. Uh, my graduate and I published this uh, review paper a couple of years ago, and we conceptualized telomeres as the cellular measuring stick indicating the cumulative effect of psychological and physical stressors experienced across the lifespan. So kind of like a sponge that absorbs both positive and negative uh, influences uh, that can be observed uh, over time. And to illustrate this in a figure, the impact of stress on telomeres. So uh, what I'm showing you here is the shortening of telomeres. Uh, with increasing cell division. Uh, so we start uh, with long telomeres and then again with each cell division we're losing these small segments of telomeres until the telomeres are getting to a critical short length and then the cell enters cellular senescence. This is also known as the Hayflick limit, the maximum number of times uh, that a given cell can divide. And this is what we think is going on with the exposure to stress. So telomeres will erode faster and the cells will divide instead of 50 to 60 times, maybe 20 to 30 times, and then they will enter cellular senescence. And again, this is one of the hallmarks of aging. Um, the mechanisms of how telomeres are causing, how stress is causing telomeres to erode faster are still not known. Uh, so this is a very active uh, area of research now in the field. So this figure is from a review paper illustrating a conceptual model to explain the role of telomeres uh, across life and its effect on health and disease. So there is evidence, and I promise I will show you some of this evidence uh, soon, uh, in relation to prenatal adversity and childhood trauma that can impact the rate of telomere shortening as indicated here as biological or cellular age in parallel to chronological age. These uh, unidirectional arrowheads are indicating the causal direction. So we think the direction goes from stress, from trauma to shorter telomeres. We don't think that shorter telomeres is causing uh, childhood trauma. And then there is also evidence in relation to uh, adult mental disorders. In particular, depression has been studied a lot in relation to telomeres, uh, as well as age-related diseases, in particular, cardiovascular disease and cancer. And here we have the bidirectional arrowheads because we don't really know the causal direction. It may go both ways, that the existence of these conditions can uh, accelerate the shortening of telomeres, but also that short telomeres may contribute to the onset of some of these conditions. In particular, uh, cardiovascular disease uh, seems to be one of these diseases that telomeres can increase the risk uh, for that condition. And finally, uh, at the top here, you see uh, healthy lifestyle factors that can mitigate some of the uh, adverse effect of stress and trauma on uh, the rate of telomere shortening. There is a lot of research in relation to uh, exercise, to healthy diet, to sleep, to mindfulness meditation, other stress reduction methods. So all of these factors uh, could contribute to this mitigation of stress uh, on the rate of telomere shortening. All right, so now I want to focus on the effect of childhood trauma and to uh, show you some of that evidence that I mentioned before. 
And an important model to consider in this context, you are, uh, may, some of you have probably have heard about this study before, uh, it is, is this pyramid from the CDC Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Uh, this model proposes a whole life developmental cascade leading from adverse experiences uh, in childhood leading to social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, uh, adoption of health risk behavior, smoking, drug abuse, poor sleep, lack of ex exercise, et cetera, uh, disease, disability, and social problems, and eventually early mortality. Uh, so while this study is considered to be a landmark in epidemiological research, they also highlight uh, some of the scientific gaps uh, in the field. Uh, and in particular, they're missing some of the biological embedding mechanisms that can explain uh, some of these links and uh, to explain how adverse experiences early in life can lead to disease and early mortality. And speaking of uh, adverse childhood experiences, uh, this is how the CDC study uh, conceptualized uh, those adverse experiences. They uh, categorized them into physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, emotional and physical neglect, as well as household dysfunction, including uh, incarceration and mental illness of a family member, domestic violence, substance abuse, as well as divorce. So a lot of these adverse conditions uh, that can uh, cause a lot of stress for the children uh, at home. Uh, importantly, uh, the study provided evidence, evidence that it was the cumulative experience of multiple adverse exposures that was associated with the poor health outcomes rather than a particular event. Uh, and this is some of the evidence that we see also in relation to telomeres that the effect uh, of stress is seen more clearly when measured in a cumulative way, although there's also a lot of interest to investigate uh, particular types of stressors. And speaking of health outcomes, this will not come as a surprise, but adverse childhood experiences increase the risk for a host of health risk fact, uh, uh, outcomes, including some of these behavioral outcomes that you see here, uh, as well as physical and mental health conditions from obesity, diabetes, depression, uh, up to heart disease, cancer, and stroke. So a lot of uh, health risk outcomes in relation to adversity. So going back to telomeres, uh, what is the evidence uh, for an association between early life adversity and telomeres? So what I'm showing you here is the first paper that uh, reported uh, a link between childhood maltreatment and shorter telomeres. It was published in 2010. So also to kind of highlight the uh, infancy of this uh, field that the first paper was published, uh, I guess I can say 12 years ago now. Uh, it was a small pilot study uh, that asked adult participants to retrospectively uh, indicate a uh, history of childhood abuse, specifically physical and emotional neglect. And they measured telomeres and blood cells, and it provided evidence, again, that childhood maltreatment was associated with shorter telomeres, independently of chronological age, gender, smoking, and body mass index. Many studies followed, uh, providing more and more evidence for the impact of childhood adversity on uh, telomeres measured mostly in blood cells. And the final paper that I'm showing you here at the bottom was published in 2012. That was the first paper that provided that evidence in children. So all of the previous studies were conducted in adult uh, populations. Uh, this last study provided uh, evidence showing that uh, greater exposure to poor quality institutional care is uh, associated with shorter telomeres uh, in kids. Now, although these studies provided support for the effect of uh, maltreatment and adversity on telomeres, they still uh, possess several limitations. And in particular, almost most of the studies uh, included adult populations who retrospectively recalled uh, assessment of trauma. So we know there is a recall bias with this type of assessment. Uh, all of the studies included cross-sectional designs, meaning they measure telomeres at one time point. And with telomeres, we really want to look at change over time. So you need a longitudinal design with repeated assessments of uh, telomeres. And finally, the last point here is really important 
It was not known uh, whether telomeres began eroding during stress exposure in childhood or whether the telomere erosion occurred years later. So we know that uh, child maltreatment and adversity is related to all of these poor health outcomes, to obesity and to other kind of uh, conditions. And those conditions are related to shorter telomeres. So maybe when you measure telomeres in adults, they have short telomeres because of other conditions and not because of the stress and the trauma that they experienced during childhood. So saying all of that, we tried to overcome some of those limitations in the uh, study that uh, Dr. Oxford mentioned at the beginning uh, by using a longitudinal uh, design in the prospective assessment of violence exposure uh, in young children. The participant in our study came from the environmental risk or e-risk study, which is a representative birth cohort of twins in the UK. And you can see the study design here uh, at the bottom uh, with the study collection phases uh, circled in blue. So it's prospective design. We have information at birth at age two, five, seven, 10. When we conducted the study, we had information up to age 10. But this study is ongoing and the last assessment at age 18 was completed. But again, I'm only going to show you information up to age 10. Uh, we collected uh, cheek swabs to extract uh, the DNA. I didn't mention that before, but in order to measure telomeres, you need to collect uh, samples to extract the DNA. And we had the first, the first uh, tissue that was collected at age five and then at age 10, so we could look at change in telomeres over time. And in terms of violence exposure, uh, we had uh, home assessments that we assessed exposure to domestic violence between the mother and her partner, uh, frequent bullying victimization and actual physical maltreatment by an adult, including sexual abuse. Uh, and we created also uh, a cumulative violence exposure uh, scale because some kids were exposed to multiple types of violence, some kids were exposed to just one type, and some kids uh, were not exposed to violence at all. So jumping to the main results from this uh, paper that was published uh, almost 10 years ago. So again, we tested the cumulative uh, impact of violence exposure. What I'm showing you here, this is the telomeres at age five, and this is the telomeres at age 10 divided to the three, by the three groups of uh, exposure rates. So this is the uh, group without exposure. This is the group of one type of violence exposure. And this is the group who experienced two or more types of violence exposures between the age of five and 10. And you can clearly see an effect here specifically for the group who experienced two or more types of violence exposure. They had uh, an accelerated erosion of their telomeres from age five to age 10. Uh, this was not uh, seen in uh, the kids who experienced just one type of violence exposure, again, showing the impact of the cumulative effect of stress. Uh, so only the group who experienced two types of uh, violence exposures uh, had this uh, accelerated shortening of telomeres. What you can also see here uh, is the short, uh, shorter telomeres at age five for kids who were exposed to any type of violence so this was not statistically significant uh, differently from the uh, kids were not exposed, but this is one of the limitations of the study that we didn't have uh, telomere measurements measured prior to age five. You can already see perhaps the impact of stress already at age five. But independently of that, we can still see shortening of telomeres from age five to age 10. And before the onset of all of these adverse health outcomes, so at age 10, the kids were still healthy before they developed all the kind of mental health outcomes. So this may provide a mechanism of why they may be at increased risk uh, later in life. So obviously there is a great interest to continue to follow these children over time and to continue to measure their telomeres and to see how they are doing over time and who develop uh, specific health outcomes. So this study was uh, the first example uh, that stress-related accelerated telomere erosion can be observed already in childhood uh, when children are experiencing stress and before uh, onset of age-related diseases. 
as I mentioned before, there's, uh, there were multiple studies and there are multiple studies that followed after our paper was published. And there are now several meta-analyses. I'm showing you here two examples of meta-analyses that were published in 2017 and 2018. And overall, uh, those uh, meta-analyses provide support for the link between early life adversity and shorter telomeres. Although they also highlight that uh, medication use, um, medical and psychiatric conditions and other methodological factors can significantly affect this relationship. So there are still a lot of factors that can contribute uh, to the variation. There's still a lot of active research in the field. And I will talk about some of the uh, limitations in the field and the, some of the current work that we are doing to optimize uh, the measurements of telomeres. All right, so returning back to this uh, conceptual model and uh, going backwards in time like Benjamin Button, I showed you evidence in relation to childhood trauma. Now I want to show you some evidence in relation to prenatal uh, adversity. And within this framework, uh, it is important to consider the developmental origin of health and disease model, which suggests that the biological embedding of adversity can begin already in utero. Uh, this developmental origin of health and disease model indicate that uh, conditions during pregnancy, which influence the environment of the fetus, uh, will have long lasting effects on adult health, including increased risk of cardiovascular and metabolic diseases as well as early mortality. So in other words, the DOHAD model suggests the hypothesis that impaired growth in utero, whether it is caused by maternal psychological stress, depression, poverty, malnutrition, et cetera, may permanently change the body's function and metabolism in the offspring, which can result in increased risk for later life physical and mental health problems and accelerated aging. And of course, the mechanisms uh, that are implicated in this process are of great interest. Telomeres are part of these mechanisms. Epigenetics are uh, another type of mechanism uh, as well that I will uh, mention later. So to test this uh, developmental origin of health and disease uh, in the context of telomeres, what I'm showing you here is the first study uh, that investigated the impact of stress exposure during pregnancy on telomeres in adult offspring. The authors uh, defined high level of prenatal psychological stress exposure uh, as the presence of major negative life event that uh, occurred to the mother uh, during her index pregnancy. So after conception and before birth, including death or severe illness of an immediate family member or loss of a primary residence, uh, et cetera. So major uh, events uh, during pregnancy. So this is the result. What they did here is they split the sample into two groups. So there is the prenatal stress group here and the comparison group, and they measure telomeres again in the uh, adult offsprings that their mothers uh, experience uh, reported the stress during pregnancy. Uh, and what you see here, the horizontal line here indicate the average for that group. So on average, the prenatal stress group had shorter telomeres compared to the uh, comparison group. Uh, and that was uh, the first evidence showing that stress exposure during um, in utero can be related to shorter telomeres uh, in adult life. What you see here again is uh, the large variation within individuals. So again, each dot here is an individual. So there are some individuals here in the prenatal stress or might be resilient or other factors that contribute to their very long telomeres and some people in the comparison group that had uh, shorter telomeres. But again, on average, you see this uh, effect. One of the main limitations of the study is, of course, that they measure telomeres uh, in the adult offsprings, and a lot of things can happen uh, when you measure telomeres in adult uh, individuals that were in their early 20s. Uh, so the same group of uh, investigators followed up with uh, another study, and this time uh, they tested the same hypothesis, but they measured telomeres in the newborn, uh, in specifically in cord, cord blood. What you see here is the correlation between pregnancy-specific stress that the mother reported during pregnancy, and this is the length of telomeres in cord blood. Uh, so again, the higher levels of pregnancy-specific stress were associated with 
shorter telomeres uh, in the infants at birth. Uh, it's a small pilot study, uh, but um, and I'm only showing it to you because it was the first study that uh, reported that uh, effect uh, at birth. But there is more studies that followed and are providing uh, a bit more information, more evidence uh, for this relationship. So again, some evidence linking stress during pregnancy with telomeres in the offspring. So we also conducted a study to test the developmental origin of health and disease. Uh, in our study, we didn't focus on uh, psychological stress uh, or major events during pregnancy. We focused specifically on perinatal complications uh, in relation to aging indicators uh, by midlife. And in order to show you the results for the study, uh, I need to take you to the other side of the world, uh, to a city uh, in the South Island of uh, New Zealand called Dunedin, uh, which is the birthplace of the Dunedin Longitudinal Study. Uh, the Dunedin Study is a birth cohort of uh, more than 1,000 individuals uh, who were born uh, between 1972 and 1973 in the same hospital in the same city in Dunedin, uh, New Zealand. Uh, the court uh, is followed from birth to most recently age 38, even, even though this is not updated. Uh, I'm going to show you results uh, when we conducted the study up to age 38, but the study is still ongoing. Uh, the phase of uh, age 45 was actually completed and the hope is to continue the study uh, until the end. And there is uh, repeated assessments uh, of the study members, uh, again, from birth to uh, up to age 45. Um, and the, one of the most astonishing uh, facts about the study is what you see here, the last column here is the percent is the retention rate. So the age 45, 95% uh, of the living members took part in the study, which is really astonishing for these types of longitudinal studies. And this is one of the reasons why the Dedinian study is considered to be the most successful longitudinal study of a, of a human population. And I was uh, very lucky to be involved uh, in this study uh, and to do the, the, um, the research that I'm going to show you. So uh, specifically what we did um, to test the hypotheses that perinatal complications are related with uh, biomarkers of accelerated aging, uh, and midlife. Our study included uh, information at birth uh, about 18 common obstetric uh, problems in the mother and the baby right before and right after birth. And you see here uh, some examples of these obstetric complications that we included. And uh, we, based on again the evidence that the effect of adverse conditions are cumulative, we, uh, each condition was weighted equally and summed to yield an obstetric complication index. So uh, almost 64% of the study members had no perinatal complications. A quarter of the study members had one type of perinatal complication and 11% had two or more. Our aging uh, outcomes were assessed at the age of 38. And again, that was the last assessment that was available at that time. And specifically, we looked at telomeres that were measured in uh, blood cells and leukocytes. And we also included perceived facial aging as an indicator of aging. And I will explain uh, shortly how we did that. Uh, considering this is a prospective study that we have information from birth up to age 38, uh, there is a lot of factors that can contri contribute uh, can be linked with both aging indicators in midlife and uh, perinatal complications. So we control for a lot of factors uh, that can mediate some of these effects. And specifically, we control for family histories of medical problems, for childhood social adversity that was averaged from birth to age 11, cognitive health measured through IQ uh, tests averaged from age 7 to 38, mental health, uh, again, average from uh, in adulthood, vascular health and physical health. Uh, in the paper that we published, we summarize, we explain ex exactly how we assessed all of these uh, measures and how we combine them together. Uh, so to show you the results in relation to telomeres. So this is the main, uh, main results. Uh, what you see here is that perinatal complications at birth predicted 
shorter telomeres at age 38 in a dose response manner. Again, very similar to what other papers have shown uh, that the uh, impact of stress is seen more clearly in a cumulative way. So study members who had two or more perinatal complications had shorter telomeres than study members with one who had shorter telomeres than study members who were not, did not experience any uh, complications. And again, independently of all of these other um, outcomes that we measured in between all of these family histories of medical problem, childhood social adversity, and all of the health outcomes. So this is in relation to uh, telomeres. And the second uh, measure that we included was perceived facial age. Uh, so to assess perceived age, we uh, included two measures. The first one was age range that was assessed by a panel of four raters. They were blind to the actual age of the study members. They had no idea that all of them are 38 years old. And they used the scale to categorize each study member into a five-year age range from 20 to 24, 25 to 30, up to 65 to 70. So that was the first um, measure. The second measure was relative age that uh, was assessed by a different panel of writers. And they were told that all of the photos were of people of age 38 years old. And they uh, had to use a, um, a scale of seven item scale and to uh, indicate study members young looking for one up to old looking, uh, which was seven. And then we standardized uh, both measures to be on the same scale and we averaged them. And that was uh, the perceived age scale that we used in our study. And to show you the uh, results with the perinatal complication, very similar to what we've seen with telomeres, you see the effect in a dose response manner. So study members who had a higher number of perinatal complications were also rated to look older uh, based on their uh, photos. Um, again, this is the opposite uh, scale here uh, in contrast to uh, the shorter telomeres that I've shown, I, I showed you before. Uh, another thing to note here is that uh, shorter telomeres were also correlated with older perceived age. So study members who had shorter telomeres old, also were perceived to be older looking. And this is something that uh, has been shown with other papers that shorter telomeres are also correlated with perceived facial aging. So overall, I've, our findings provided some, some of the support for early life developmental programming by linking uh, newborns' perinatal complications uh, to accelerate aging in midlife uh, using both of these objective and subjective measures of aging. Eden? Yes. Do you have a moment for two questions that came up? Sure. Okay. Uh, do psychotropic medications for mental illness affect telomeres? Good question. Uh, there is mixed evidence. Some of the evidence is showing yes. Uh, it can influence the enzyme that can regulate the length of telomeres, telomerase. I didn't mention telomerase again because there is not enough time to talk about all of the factors, but there is some evidence that psychiatric medications can uh, impact the length of telomeres, but there is, uh, there is mixed evidence. Except, okay. Yeah. And then do you know of any researchers who are studying the effect of stress and the pandemic on telomere length? And yes. how does telomere, okay, that question, and then how does telomere length compare with newborns who are exposed to COVID in utero and or have a diagnosis of COVID after birth? Oh, wow, okay, so those are, Excellent questions. So the last question in relation to COVID and newborns and pregnancy related stress, we don't, I don't think there is any paper, any evidence. Uh, I will be very curious to see uh, the effect. I uh, can conceptual, I can think of what, you know, what we would expect to see. In general, in relation to COVID, there is actually good uh, theory to conceptualize telomeres uh, in that uh, process that individuals with shorter telomeres might be at increased risk of uh, COVID complications, uh, specifically shorter telomeres in T cells. So T cells are the types of cells that need to fight the COVID uh, infection. And, and if there are shorter telomeres in T cells, once we are infected with COVID, they need to replicate and to kind of fight the infection. 
if they have shorter telomeres, if we have shorter telomeres in those T cells, they will divide rapidly and then enter senescence and then will die. So we will experience these severe uh, symptoms. So there is good evidence to suggest that telomeres are very important and should be monitored. Um, there is some empirical evidence are starting to be published now, but again, this is all very new, uh, but uh, telomeres, yes, seems to be very important in relation to COVID. Thanks. Yeah. Um, for the psychotropic meds, uh, someone's wanting to know if it's shortening the telomeres or maybe lengthening them. Yeah, so the, so it's, it's mixed, mixed. It? So the mix is, you know, going both ways. Uh, some of the earlier studies showing actually was related to increased level of telomerase enzymes. So that's supposed to kind of uh, prevent telomeres from getting, you know, from shortening. Um, but again, there's mixed evidence and uh, there's some publication bias and we need large sample sizes. I'm going to talk about some of the limitations in the field um, with uh, kind of the measurements of telomeres. So again, I don't have a clear answer. It can be, it can go both ways. Okay, and one more question, then I'll let you get back. Are there correlations between biomarkers of inflammation and telomere length? Another excellent question, and absolutely inflammation uh, is one of the primary mechanisms that uh, is hypothesized to regulate length of telomeres. So if you think about telomeres are measured mostly in most studies in immune cells in the blood, uh, and inflammation can cause this increase of cell divisions of these immune cells. So if they are causing increase of cell divisions, and as I mentioned, as I explained earlier, telomeres are getting shorter with cell division. So we would expect to see a shortening of telomeres with higher levels of inflammation. So uh, there's a lot of these inflammatory markers that have been linked with telomeres. There's oxidative stress. I'm going to talk about mechanisms actually in this slide. So it's good timing. All right. Uh, and yeah, please feel free to stop me again if there are any other questions. All right, so considering uh, the actual mechanisms, uh, if we go back to the question of how uh, childhood adversity gets under the skin uh, and the long-term impact of uh, risk for edge-related diseases, uh, it might be that you know, we can think about telomeres as this master integrator, linking the experience of stress and trauma in childhood uh, to the risk of all of these edge-related diseases later in life. But still, there is all of these open questions of how stress is actually causing telomeres to get shorter and how shorter telomeres is causing the onset of these conditions. There could be through a lot of these biochemical stressors in the cell epigenetic uh, regulations. I'm going then to talk about epigenetics uh, soon. Could be through uh, stress systems, through higher levels of cortisol, Inflammation, we just talked about inflammation, it's a primary mechanism. Oxidative stress, so the ratio between uh, free radicals and antioxidants. Oxidative stress can really damage the telomeres and can also cause uh, rapid telomere shortening. Uh, mitochondria, so mitochondria is a very hot topic in the field, the powerhouse for, uh, for the cell that uh, can contribute a lot of these free radicals and increase levels of oxidative stress, so mitochondria seems to be very important as well. But again, there's not enough uh, research. And of course, uh, our thoughts, our emotions, our behavior, all of these factors are also very important to consider. So we really need to take this holistic approach, comprehensive approach to understand uh, the underlying mechanism linking early trauma uh, to risk of edge-related diseases. And this is the more kind of complicated view. So this is uh, as, uh, as depicted in this somewhat ambitious figure uh, from a review paper uh, to try to kind of capture what was known at that time in relation to telomere shortening and maintenance and lengthening. The latter is a very contentious uh, topic in the field whether telomeres can actually get longer. Maybe some of you are thinking, you know, want to ask whether we can increase the length of telomeres. So the answer for this is maybe, we don't really know. Um, it could be that we can prevent the rate of telomeres to not get shorter at increased rate, but it's not clear whether we can get telomeres to get much longer than what they are. So there's a lot of these factors that I mentioned that I showed in the previous slide, inflammation, oxidative stress, all of these positive kind of uh, factors related to uh, 
positive healthy lifestyle factors, uh, some of the kind of uh, genomic control, as well as some, some of the unknowns and some of the kind of statistical considerations that can also impact uh, the uh, length of telomeres and what is reported in publications, including some of the interactions between of these factors. So again, that was a very ambitious, ambitious uh, attempt to kind of capture all of these factors. If I have to come up with the, uh, a different figure today, I will probably uh, um, put different factors here. And there's, for example, mitochondria is not included here in this uh, telomere length regulation. So there's still a lot of uh, research that needs to be done. All right, so besides the questions of potential mechanisms, there's also a lot of other open questions in the field. Uh, and these are some of the questions. So first of all, which type of stress matters the most? So the evidence that I showed you and what uh, most of the other uh, studies have been shown is that it's the cumulative effect of stress. So when you measure it st stress in a cumulative manner, the chronic experience of stress over time, that has the most significant impact of telomeres, but again, there's also interest to understand specific types of adversity, threat-related, neglect-related, sexual abuse could also matter. Uh, so there is also interest in the specific types of stress, um, the onset of stress, the duration of stress. So a lot of these factors are important. Another open question is, the, and this is a very big question now, is the optimal measurement method. Uh, there are various approaches to measure telomeres. Uh, some of them are less reliable than others, and I'm going to talk about it a bit more in the uh, next slide. Uh, so we are currently trying to optimize the measurement methods for telomeres, not just us. There's a lot of other groups uh, in the country who are uh, involved. Then there's a question of different tissue cells. So most of the, cell, most of the studies in adults are measuring telomeres in uh, blood cells, in immune cells. But even immune cells are composed, are, uh, there are dozens of cells that are part of the immune cells, of the leukocytes. Uh, there's the T cells, there are B cells, the neutrophils, the xenophils, there's a lot of different cells. So which cell matter more? Uh, for COVID, for example, you probably want to focus specifically on T cells, right? When we think about studies in children, most of the studies are using non-invasive methods to collect uh, cells and uh, Dr. Oxford and I talked a lot about uh, the types of assessments of how we can collect um, cells from uh, young children. So most of the people collect saliva or cheek swabs to uh, extract uh, buccal DNA. But what is the meaning of measuring telomeres in saliva DNA or buccal DNA? So those are some of still some of those open questions and as well as telomere lengthening. So I mentioned the open question of telomere lengthening. This is still an open question in the field. So uh, while telomeres uh, is a popular marker, biomarker to study uh, the influences on health and aging, after all of the hype and interest of the early years, uh, the, there are still a lot of open questions and the field is still in its uh, infancy, or probably I can say now in the childhood years. Uh, and there are still, again, a lot of these open questions. So in 2017, the NIH, specifically the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Institute on Aging, uh, organized this workshop uh, that they called telomeres as sentinels of environmental exposures, psychosocial stress and disease susceptibility. So you can see how NIH thought about telomeres at that time. And they invited experts from basic telomere biology, medicine, biopsychology, epidemiology, and related fields to discuss how basic researchers can help epidemiologists and clinicians and vice versa. And the work, workshop concluded with a recommendation uh, that a set of guidelines for measurements be produced. So these are uh, some of the points from the executive summary for that workshop uh, that was uh, conducted over a couple of days. Uh, specifically develop a consensus guidelines for reporting, for uh, publishing telomere studies, conducting a robust methods comparison study, um, encourage more research on telomere length dynamics. So as I mentioned earlier, we don't really have good evidence from birth to death of how telomeres are changing. So we need more of this uh, longitudinal research. Focus on early life determinants are uh, appreciating that uh, this is a very sensitive developmental period. So we want more of these studies 
to understand the factors that can contribute to the regulation of telomeres, develop better measures of stress exposures and foster interdisciplinary collaboration. So a lot of these um, points that we are trying to do now uh, and specifically following this workshop, the NH also released a call for researchers uh, to form uh, a telomere research network. And this is an active network now. So in 2019, uh, the NIH funded several groups of us. Um, and my lab is one of those groups that we are uh, tasked with uh, exploring some of those uh, open questions and conducting these comparative uh, studies, trying to optimize the rigor uh, of the telomere field. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of uh, different measurement methods and some of these open questions. Uh, and I just want to read to you, uh, if you go to this website and if you read the kind of about the telomere research network, this is what um, it says there. So across scientific fields, there is growing interest in the utilization of telomere length as the sentinel of the environmental exposome and psychosocial stress across the life course and as a predictor of mortality, aging-related health outcomes, and health span. Although telomeres is the primary hallmark of aging and is linked to disease risk and exposures in meta-analytic studies, inconsistencies across studies and procedures hamper our ability to test fundamental mechanisms and interactive models. Despite these limitations, the value of telomere research is significant as meta-analytic findings have confirmed relationship between telomeres and all-cause mortality, depression, schizophrenia, cardiovascular disease, as well as presumed precursors, including air pollution and early life stress. The Telomere Research Network will emphasize synergistic research that capitalizes on existing networks and infrastructure, accessible cohorts and expertise across diverse disciplines, including aging, stress, environmental exposure, development, and biostatistics. And again, some of the goals for uh, the TRN, for the Telomere Research Network, is to uh, increase the rigor of uh, the field and to try to kind of overcome some of those open questions that I uh, highlighted before. And this is a lot of the work that we are currently doing in the lab um, with other groups. So this is uh, an active uh, research that is happening now. All right, I don't know how we are doing with time. Are we okay? Uh, it is. It's three, almost three o'clock. We got a couple more minutes and we have some more questions. So, okay. All right. So, uh, let me shift gears now. And uh, I only have a few more slides left. Um, so, I just want to talk about some other advances, other types of measures in the field. Uh, so, in addition to telomeres, there's also uh, other types of biological aging clocks, which is defined as a method to predict the age in years of a subject or a biological sample. A lot of these methods have been used, uh, use uh, machine learning methods on gene expression data, protein data, composite clinical um, biomarker measurements, as well as epigenetics. So I just want to kind of focus on epigenetics because this is at the cutting edge and there's a lot of excitement about epigenetic aging clocks specifically measured through DNA methylation. And very quickly, quick primer on epigenetic. If you've never heard about epigenetics, so what I'm showing you here is the central dogma of biology. So we have the DNA that is being transcribed to messenger RNA that provide information to synthesize uh, proteins. Epigenetic, epi in Greek uh, means in addition or on top of. So epi is on, epigenetic is information that is laid on top of the DNA which is basically controlling uh, gene expression. So in other words, epigenetic is like the on-off switch that tells the genes when and how uh, to be activated. And using this epigenetic information, uh, the first uh, clock uh, to predict age was developed in 2013 by Steve Horvath. That was uh, an amazing study uh, that was conducted by Horvath at, uh, at that time. Uh, he used 8,000 samples across 51 healthy tissues and cell types and using machine learning methods. He computed an epigenetic clock to predict age, the age of the sample. What I'm showing you in this very crowded figure 
are 25 different tissue cells. And what you see here is the methylation age on the X plotted against the actual age of the tissue. So very strong correlations across all of these tissues uh, for this specific clock that uh, Steve Horvath developed. Um, and because the clocks are so predictive of chronological age, researchers have proposed that a rate of biological aging can be measured as the difference between the predicted epigenetic age and the actual chronological age. And there is a lot of other clocks that are being developed. So this is the first generation clock, what I'm showing you here. And to illustrate this uh, in the figure, what you see here is an example of the predicted epigenetic age plotted against the actual chronological age. So for example, if we take a seven-year-old individual here, so this individual will be predicted to have the exact same epigenetic age as the same chronological age. But for, uh, in contrast, this individual, who is also seven years old uh, chronologically, will have a much older epigenetic age. So it might be uh, at the age of 80 or 90 epigenetically. And in contrast, this individual will be measured to have, uh, to be much younger biologically as measured through this epigenetic aging clock. So there are also a lot of variations using these clocks, very similar to what we see with telomeres. So this measure can be used again, to study the impact of stress on health and disease in a very similar manner uh, the telomere length are doing. And this is a slide that summarizes a lot of the research that is currently ongoing uh, with epigenetic age clocks uh, in relation to age deceleration. So again, all of the positive healthy lifestyle factors that have been uh, related to um, age deceleration as measured through these epigenetic aging clocks and all of the other kind of factors that have been related to age acceleration, so older epigenetic age, as well as gender, so very similar to telomeres. Women on average have younger epigenetic aging clock versus men. Uh, there is also evidence with in relation to all-cause mortality, so older epigenetic age is also predicting early mortality. There is some evidence in relation to stress and childhood violence, and there's also evidence um, in relation to BMI, so I'm highlighting this just because we just submitted a paper providing evidence uh, linking obesity with epigenetic aging clocks. So obesity in relation to older epigenetic age in children, which is the first example showing that um, this can be also be used in pediatric uh, samples because most of the studies are, are were conducted in adult population. So uh, can also be used in uh, younger cohorts in pediatric populations. And finally, I only have two slides, so if you can uh, stay for a bit longer. So I just want to finish with some of the work that is currently uh, ongoing uh, here at Penn State. So uh, I joined Penn State in 24, uh, 2014, uh, and also the Child Maltreatment Solutions Network, which was a Penn State uh, academic response to the Sandusky uh, child sex uh, scandal. Uh, and what Penn State did is they uh, created this network and they recruited uh, uh, 13 faculty across five different uh, colleges, what you see here, the College of uh, Liberal Arts, uh, Col College of Health and Human Development, as well as uh, College of uh, Medicine. And we are forming this uh, trauma treatment solutions network to try to investigate uh, the biological embedding uh, of trauma and to um, find uh, so, uh, some of the solutions for victims of abuse. And uh, just to highlight the current research that we are uh, currently conducting here. So several years, we were lucky to receive this uh, P50 center grant from the NIH. Uh, and specifically using the uh, child welfare information system, we are currently recruiting a large cohort of children between uh, eight and 13 years of age around the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, to participate in a study focused on eradicating health disparities for children who experience trauma. And the goal of this study is to elucidate uh, the multiple etiological processes that believe to play a role in the onset of and maintenance of adverse health outcomes for victims. Where specifically, as you can see here, uh, focusing on sexual abuse, physical abuse, and neglect, uh, we are including children with substantial abuse over the past year. And some of the uh, health outcomes include, health disparity out outcomes include brain health through brain imaging, 
uh, behavioral and emotional, as well as physical health. Crucially, we are also characterizing the biological embedding of stress, uh, which is really uh, a unique aspect of the study because we are collecting multiple blood samples from the children, as well as urine samples and saliva samples uh, to assess neuroendocrine, autonomic, immunologic, epigenetic, and telomere biology, uh, and also change in these markers over time because we are following all of the children and the families every two years. Uh, so we'll be able to look at change over time. And also important, we are also interested in indicators of resilience in order to learn how to better intervene. So these include, as you can see here, healthy lifestyle factors, including diet, exercise, and sleep, uh, and resilience factors such as school engagement, self-esteem, family and peer support, cognitive ability, emotional regulation, and executive functions. So really trying to capture all of these factors that are really important uh, to understand who is more resilient in relation to uh, health outcomes. So we hope to learn more about the biological embedding of trauma and to identify targets for interventions to help survivors of child abuse uh, live a healthy and productive life. And on this optimistic note, and sorry for taking longer, I would like to end and just to thank all of my lab members, the many collaborators, uh, the funding agencies, and uh, to you for your uh, attention. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. We do have questions. Um, I can read them off for you. Okay. Great. The first uh, comment is great presentation. Very interesting. How about individuals who've had difficult lives, extreme poverty, uh, child abuse, alcoholic, alcoholism in the family, diagnosed with cancer twice, diabetes, high blood pressure, and still live to be 87 years old? Yes. Yes. <laughs> great question. Um, yeah, what about centenarians? So this is actually a, a story that I'm telling to my students in class when I'm teaching in relation about aging and stress and trauma. Uh, I give the example of Jean Clement. So Jean Clement uh, was a French woman who died in 1997. If you've never heard about her, her name, uh, she's actually very famous in the uh, aging field. She is the oldest living human being who lived to be 122 and a half. At that age, it's important to also count the you know, month. Uh, she experienced a lot of stress in her life. She lost her only child uh, to pneumonia at the age of 37. She lost her only grandchild uh, in a car accident, also at the age of 37. She outlived her husband and her only child and her only grandchild by decades. Uh, so obviously she experienced a lot of stress, a lot of trauma. Uh, she was a smoker. <laughs> so she, she smoked uh, not a lot of cigarettes. She uh, smoked like one or two cigarettes. Um, so she experienced a lot of this trauma and didn't necessarily live a very healthy lifestyle factor. So how did she live to 122 and a half, right? So she used to say that if you can do anything about it, don't worry about it. So that was her kind of way to cope with life. Um, so that's kind of, you know, is an anecdote about um, kind of coping with stress. But I guess what's uh, one of the other factors uh, that is important here is genetics. So a lot of people can experience a lot of trauma, can uh, experience a lot of diseases and can still live to old age. Genes are very important, you know, so uh, this is something that we can control. Um, and they're very important and they can, uh, you know, uh, explain some of these variations, why people are more resilient. It's not all about the kind of environment and uh, stress reduction methods is also partly because uh, of our genes and the interactions between the genes and the environment, the kind of the nature nurture interaction. So genes Great. are important, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ed Tronic asks, what about the evidence of developmental maturity and different kinds of stress? Is there evidence related to that? Oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I don't know from the top of my head if there is any specific evidence in relation to that. There is a lot of research in relation to pubertal development. Uh, so, you know, looking at, in general, assessing stress before and after puberty to see whether that can have any impact um, on all of these kind of aging indicators. We know that uh, advanced uh, early pubertal development is related to these aging 
markers or so shorter telomeres and advanced epigenetic aging clocks. And there's a lot of these kind of evolutionary theories to explain why there's, you know, we expect to see, we would expect to see these, uh, this uh, evidence. Uh, but specifically for that question, I'm not sure. It's a great question though. I don't know the, okay. the answer. Is there a correlation between telomere length and parasympathetic tone? Interesting. Uh, I don't think so. One of the reasons will be, um, hmm. there is some mixed evidence in relation to telomeres and, and cortisol. So one of them, so telomeres is more static, uh, static measure. You wouldn't expect to see very dynamic changes in telomeres. So it's not like you can stress an individual and take repeated samples and see the kind of shortening of telomeres and then it's bounced back to normal like you see with, with cortisol. Parasympathetic activity, again, it's a very dynamic, a very short term um, process. So I don't know if that uh, state uh, effect of, of parasymp parasympathetic activity will be related to kind of a trait uh, effect on, on telomeres. Uh, I can't remember, I don't know if there's any uh, studies that have tested that. So I don't know. It's an interesting question though, whether to, you know, are, the two are related. Great. Um, there's another comment by Dr. Edtronic about the importance of parent-child interaction with sculpts resilience and that most abuse is actually perpetrated by uh, within a relationship. And then there's some comments about that and uh, the importance of relationships. I don't know if you want to comment on, I mean, part of our research will be to look at caregiver sensitivity right. and intervention as a buffering for children within the child welfare system. Absolutely, and I agree, yeah. And, and this is some of the research that is needed and that yeah. we are currently going to do, yeah. A lot of thank yous, wonderful talk. Um, another question. So is the actual shortening of telomeres or the factors that lead to shortening a proxy for the complicated, for the complicated processes involved in stress? Uh, sorry, I, I uh, can you repeat that question again? So is the actual shortening of telomeres or the factors that lead to shortening and short telomere are a proxy for yeah. the complicated process involved in stress? Excellent question. So, um, you know, in a statistical analysis, it can show that telomeres are linked or related with a specific outcome, with a specific exposure. The question about a causality of if it's an actual causal in the process, we don't know. Uh, this is, this is an, a, an one of those open questions that we are really interested in. Uh, at the end of the day, um, and, and a lot of researchers in the field are using epigenetic aging clocks because with the epigenetic aging clocks, again, this is using machine learning that you're uh, you know, computing information from hundreds and sometimes, you know, uh, many hundreds of these kind of CPG islands, uh, this kind of methylation side. So what is the mechanism, you know, so we don't really know. Uh, but a lot of people in that field saying like, who cares if we can use this metric to really evaluate the impact of intervention, if it can really predict uh, disease onset, we can just use this in a, as a metric. The question about the causality, about the actual mechanism, that's another step, another you know, um, uh, research that we will have to do to really kind of understand what's going on. Uh, and we are, we are in, in my lab, are very interested in the what's going on question. Great. Um, there's a lot of thank yous. This is fascinating and asking if there will be a recording and there will be a recording. We're gonna, uh, we have to process it first and it will be on our YouTube channel. So I think Maureen can send out a reminder to everyone who registered of the recording. So you'll get a link to that at some point. Maureen's nodding, yes. Thank you, Maureen. Um, lots of thank yous. This is super valuable, uh, much appreciated. And then Sarah, someone asks, uh -huh. Sorry, can I, can, I, can I interrupt? Oh, yes. I, I also, I just opened the chat. So I, I see uh, Rachel May uh, and, uh, asked a question about, transgenerational contribution to stress and telomeres. So this is an actually interesting question because we published a, a paper in relation to intergenerational uh, impact of uh, abuse on telomeres in the offspring. 
So I showed some of that evidence of stress exposure during pregnancy on telomeres and offspring. Uh, we published a paper of women uh, who experienced sexual abuse uh, in their teenage life. And then uh, we measured telomeres in their offsprings uh, where we actually didn't see any evidence. So that was a null finding. So there is also some mixed evidence. There's other studies showing there might be uh, you know, intergenerational impact, but uh, there again, there's some mixed evidence uh, in relation to that, but that was, uh, that was an, just an interesting question. Uh, that, yeah. yeah. A question right above that we haven't gotten to yet is, could you focus, if you could focus on any age to maximize stress reduction, relationship-based interventions, what age would you choose? Yeah, such a great question. Um, I, I, I don't have a, a clear answer. What, what I can say is that what I showed at the, at the beginning is that uh, the telomeres appear to be the most receptive to environmental influences early in life. So in the opening years of life, you know, I can say in the, in the first decade of life, that telomeres appear to be very sensitive and, you know, with all of the kind of these sensitive developmental periods that, you know, brain maturation, uh, epigenetic processes are also very important at that time, uh, during that uh, uh, developmental period. So I guess during childhood, uh, I don't know when during childhood, I guess there is, a, uh, there is a limit of, you know, how early can you start uh, to train kids uh, to use stress reduction methods, but uh, I can also guess, you know, I can say that it's never late to start. So even if you experience a lot of stress, there's still a lot of uh, stuff that you can do later in life. Even you're in your 50s or 60s, you can still start, you know, eating healthy and doing exercise. There's uh, evidence that you can also still help even later in life, even if you didn't do that early. Yeah. And part of our research that we're approaching, and Dr. Carrie Dell Smith, who might still be on this line, uh, she's doing in her clinic, is to help parents meet the social and emotional needs of kids. We're using promoting first relationships as a way to do that because parents can serve as a buffer for stress for infants and toddlers. And we just have to help parents on how to do that. And so uh, Dr. Shaliv and I and Dr. Carrie Dell Smith are doing a study on telomere. We're piloting the procedures right now, but our hope is to really dive into the use of relationship based strategies to uh, shorten aging and actually reduce health disparities. That's, that's ultimately, you know, if we could slow down the process, that would be uh, a win. Okay, so, uh, oh, and uh, let's see, somebody said, please note Dr. Edtronic's response, start early, as early as possible. Um, any other questions? And you can raise your hand too, if you want to. Uh, another thank you for this presentation with plain language to describe complex biological concepts, a wonderful speaker. Lots of people appreciating you. Thank you. I'm glad it was clear. Um, great. Super clear. All right. If there are no more questions,